indicate some of those who attacked the consulate were inspired in part by televised scenes of protesters storming the American embassy in Cairo in rage over an anti-Muslim video running on the Internet. On September 11, 2015, Jacksonville, Florida honored those lost in Benghazi who stood up instead of standing down. The Benghazi tribute was held to honor four American heroes that were murdered and 10 Americans who were wounded in the Battle of Benghazi three years earlier on September 11, 2012. The solemn memorial service honoring the United States Ambassador to Libya, Mr. Chris Stevens, U.S. Navy veteran SEAL Tyrone Woods, U.S. Navy veteran SEAL Glenn Darty, and U.S. Navy veteran Sean Smith, who gave their last full measure on 11 September 2012, included military honors, the colors procession, laying on of wreaths for the four heroes, and echo taps. Jacksonville came together to honor those who fought valiantly in Benghazi and to get informed on those in our government who have refused to honor their commitment and who refuse to protect Ambassador Chris Stevens and his security staff. Now you can have the opportunity to hear the real story on Benghazi and its impact on our nation from four great Americans who know the truth. The first part is retired Admiral Ace Lyons of the Citizen Commission on Benghazi to tell us the truth of what really happened in Benghazi. The second speaker is a distinguished Michael Del Rosso, who tells us the threat. The third speaker is retired Rear Admiral Charles Cubitt, who shares the consequences of what happened in Benghazi. A special question and answer panel discussion is part four, where these speakers are joined by the knowledgeable Stephanie Jason. Follow along in each part to learn the whole story, the true story. My name is Ryman Shope, and I am the MC of Jacksonville's Point of Truth. Admiral Lyons served as surface warfare officer in the Navy for 36 years and was commander U.S. Pacific Fleet from 1985 to 1987. He was a member of the Citizens Commission on Benghazi. Help me in giving a warm welcome to Admiral Ace Lyons. Well, well, let me say, your presence here tonight says it all. You understand we have a major problem. Not only a constitutional problem, but a congressional leadership problem. We have to clean house. And let me say, you know, it's nice to be with real Americans, and I thank you all for coming tonight. And I'd like you all to join me in a special hand to Beth for putting this program together. about what happened on 9-11-12, and we'll get to that. But there's a few things I want to cover before we do. And, you know, I want you to be thinking about this kabuki dance that's going on in Washington over the pathological liar's email, Hillary. And I got to tell you, you know, if this was just an ordinary screw up, you know, you'd come to the floor and you say what it is, you take your lumps and you move on. But this massive cover up, all the redacted emails and the destruction of emails, tells you there's a hell of a lot more there that must be uncovered. Now, I've got to tell you, never in my lifetime did I believe I would witness this great country of ours being taken down by our own administration. Unbelievable. <laughs> You know, when you want to take a country down, the first thing you do is undercut the military. 
That's why sequestration was the perfect storm for the Obama administration. It provided the legal mechanism for the unilateral disarmament of our military. Now I gotta tell you, our defense budget represents 17% of the federal budget. But under sequestration, we required to eat 50%, a trillion dollars over 10 years. This is mind boggling. And what's the end result? We're now going to wind up with the smallest army prior to World War II. We're going to wind up with the smallest navy prior to World War I. Not World War II, World War I. We're down to 278 ships. And to put that number in perspective, <clears throat> That's about the number of ships I had under my command in the Pacific Fleet. Now what's left is the remains of Ronald Reagan's 600 ship Navy. So, it's okay. And for the Air Force, the Air Force is going to be the smallest in its history. And more importantly, their readiness is down 50%. So here we've taken the finest military fighting unit in the world, and we're disarming. We are jeopardizing our national security. Now compounding all of that is the social engineering that has been forced on our military. the gay-lesbian agenda, women in combat, and now taking in transgenders. This is unbelievable. This is mind-boggling. And what it's doing, it is undermining unit integrity, cohesiveness, and the warrior mentality and the will to win. We're putting people in command who should never be there. And I gotta tell you, for all you gals, there are many viable role and jobs for women in the military. Combat is not one of them. Now, We've had many opportunities to change the course of history. And it hasn't mattered whether it's been a Democrat or a Republican administration, they all failed. Unbelievable. Now, let me give you one example, and in the interest of time, I'll cut this down. When Ayatollah Khomeini took over our embassy in Tehran, the chairman called me up, I was the director of political and military affairs then, and he said, what can we do? And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take Cog Island. And his question, where is it? <laughs> it's okay, he was Air Force. <laughs> Because, as you all know, Cog Island is Iran's main exporting depot for their life run oil. We were going to walk in with our Navy SEALs. It was wide open. Here, Iran is in a life and death struggle. And it's starting up with, a, with Iraq. We could have walked in. We could have cut off Islamic fundamentalism at the knees. We were going to make Cog Island, if they didn't get out of our embassy in 24 hours and turn over our diplomats, we were going to make it look like the biggest ashtray in the Middle East. Well, of course, that never happened. 
because President Carter rejected it. He thought, and so help me God, I'm telling the truth. Comini was a religious man, and he was a religious man, and they'd be able to communicate. This is more than a failure of intelligence. <laughs> All right, now, there's one thing you all should never forget. It's 9-11-2001, and I know you never will. But what you should always remember is it was Iran who provided the key material and training support to the 9-11 hijackers. Without that support, that attack could not have been carried out, and 3,000 Americans would be alive today. Yeah. Here's our leader, President Obama, now going to strike a nuclear weapons deal with a leading state sponsor of terrorism throughout the world. I spoke on Capitol Hill on Wednesday, and I gotta tell you, this is more than mind-boggling. And I wanna take you back, how did this happen? What's going on here? I wanna take you back to the summer of 2008, when President Obama was candidate Obama. And this shows the character of the man that is President of the United States. He opened up the secret communication channel to the Ayatollah Khomeini regime. It was done through Ambassador George W. Miller, who was our former ambassador to the Ukraine, but spoke fluent Farsi from his previous tours in Tehran. And the message was, don't do a deal with the Bush administration. Wait a long, President. You will get a much better deal. You will like my policies. You will see I am your friend. Here he's telling us to the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, He's their friend, and these are the guys that have killed thousands of Americans. To me, this bordered on treason, and certainly it was a violation of the Logan Act. So, again, here we are. What's behind all this? You know, four days before President Obama took his first oath of office. He declared he was going to fundamentally transform America. And I have to tell you, that transformation is ongoing today and is at the core of many of the problems we see. Now, he, his strategy, as I have said a number of times, is anti-American, anti-Western, but pro-Islam, pro-Iranian, and pro-Muslim Brotherhood. And you might say, how did the Muslim Brotherhood get there? Well, look at the Muslim Brotherhood's creed. And this is verified by the FBI in the Holy Land Foundation trial of 2008. Their creed is to destroy America from within by our own miserable hands. Unbelievable. Their objective 
is to make Islam dominant throughout the world and replace our constitution with the seventh century draconian law. Well, with people like you, it ain't ever gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I gotta tell you, we are in serious trouble. We cannot be silenced. We must stand up and be counted. Now, you might ask at this point, okay, let's get on to Benghazi. Well, when President Obama gave his 4 June 2009 Cairo speech, who did he have in the front row? The Muslim Brotherhood who is listed, outlawed as a terrorist group by his host, President Hosea Mubarak. And you have to understand, with the Muslim Brotherhood creed, there's no difference between Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, or ISIS. It's only the methods they use. They all have the same objective. So when you're being fed a lot of propaganda, that the Muslim Brotherhood is the alternative to the terrorist activities of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Reject it. It just is not true. So, here we go. What happened? Well, that speech was not, would launch the Arab Spring. But it wasn't an Arab Spring for freedom and democracy. It was for the green light to the Muslim Brotherhood to move, to remove our secular dictatorships who were basically were our allies and fighting Al-Qaeda. Now, from there, we shifted to the focus to Libya. And then we have where the pathological liar Hillary comes into play. And what she's sprouting there is we've got a humanitarian crisis in Benghazi. We must execute this fuzzy theory of the right to protect pure nonsense. There was never a humanitarian crisis in Benghazi. What you had was 10 Al-Qaeda out of control militias along with the Muslim Brotherhood politically controlled militias. That was the crisis. But that got swept under the rug by everybody including the mainstream media and our military leadership as well, regretfully. Now, Hillary did a meeting with Mahmoud Jabal on the 14th of March, 2011, at the Paris Western Hotel. After that 45-minute meeting, she came out in support of the rebels. Not surprising, it was all set up. But what most people don't understand, and the mainstream media refuses to address, is that we switch sides on the global war on terrorism. At that point, we facilitated the armament 
of Al-Qaeda and Muslim Brotherhood militias. Unbelievable. And it was all swept under the rug. How can this be? Well, you know, there was a deal cut. Some through some underheaded stuff. They facilitated an agreement with UAE and Qatar to provide a billion dollars worth of arms to the rebels in Libya fighting Qaddafi. And what you got to remember, Qaddafi was our ally. He was fighting the Al-Qaeda militias. And I know Chuck Kubik is going to cover the truce negotiations that he was directly involved in. So this tragedy that went on there never had to happen. And tens of thousands of people would still be alive today except for our illustrious Secretary of State and President. It never had to happen. So, here we have a billion dollars worth of arms flowing into Libya. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood saw a great opportunity because like on the 29th of March, of 2011, we had the no-fly zone, and NATO was, became in, in charge of all operations in Libya, air and sea. So we were complicit in this, what I consider, illegal arm transfer to our enemy. So, here we go. Well, as you all know, Qaddafi was killed in October of 2011. Chris Stevens was the uh, representative to the Transnational, Transnational uh, Committee. He then, in May, took over as ambassador, relieving Ambassador Krenz. By the way, who had also put in to receive additional security forces for our special mission compound because he understood the dangerous situation. In April, Hillary turned it down. Not only turned it down, withdrew additional security forces. Now, Ambassador Stevens took over. He had a relationship with a number of people in Benghazi. However, the situation was spinning out of control. On the 6th of April, 2012, we had an IED go off at our special mission compound, which blew a hole in the wall. In May, we had two RPGs fired at the International Red Cross office. We had a bomb go out, off outside the hotel where Stevens was staying and the UK ambassador. On the 6th of June, we had an I, another IED go off at our special mission compound that blew a 30-foot hole in the wall. Now, I have to tell you this. Well, two months after the special mission compound was open, there was a State Department analysis of the security of that compound. I happen to know the guy that did it. He's still on active duty, so his name cannot be used. But the analysis said, Beef up the security or close them. That analysis is buried in the Accountability Review Board report. It'll never see the light of day. But it's all laid out there. Now, 
On the 7th of June, the UK ambassador almost got killed. He was in the free car convoy. He was in the second car. The first car had a mechanical problem. So the ambassador's car became the lead convoy in leading the car in the convoy. The attack came, they took out the second car. They had dead information where he was, but through the grace of God, one of those magical things from above, he escaped. Uh, from that point on, both the UK and the International Red Cross said the situation in Benghazi in eastern Libya is untenable. They closed their offices. Now, I've always said this most strategic and tactical warning of the attack that was going to take place in Benghazi. Stevens had been requesting additional security detachments. And on cue, everyone was turned down. You don't turn down a U.S. ambassador. You support him. And I got to tell you, you know, when I first heard of what went on there, I did an op-ed. And I said, you know, this is un-American. We don't leave our people in the field. You know, and then I heard, who were the guard force? The 17th February Martyrs Brigade. This is my martyr. This is a group that's part of the Ansar al-Suria terrorist group that carried out the attack on our special mission compound. You know, in fact, when we rented that compound, two weeks after we rented it, Ansar al-Sharia rented the house right next door. They were able to monitor everything that was going on in our industry. There were no surprises. So here we go. On the 16th of August, Ambassador Stevens puts out a message. Our special mission compound cannot withstand a coordinated attack. He requests nine more personal security guards rejected. What difference does it make? <laughs> then, we then go ahead and I got to tell you, you can't, you can't make a story up like this. Here we go. We got the morning of 9-11. And before this, you got to understand that all our enemies have hacked in to our Secretary of State's server. She's totally compromised. She's damaged goods. She should not be allowed in the White House with a business pass. <laughs> All right. So, the morning of 9-11, what's the first thing? Well, Stevens goes from Tripoli over to Benghazi, even knowing the out-of-control security situation. None of you would put yourself in the crosshairs 
of a terrorist organization. But that's what he did. You know, see, you know, he's not a dumb man. He understood the out of control security situation. So again, why did he do that? Now before he went there, we used to have a 16 man special security team in Tripoli under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Andy Wood. And Andy, I personally talked to Andy Wood. And I said, Andy, did you ever participate in any of the evacuation exercises? And he said, yes, he did. I said, tell me about them. And he said, well, if an attack came, we were to get the ambassador to the safe house, the safe room, the secure room. And on that room, there are bars on the window. And you unlock the bars from the inside. And outside that window, there's to be a car. There's always a car there, except for one day. On 9-11, there was no car. Whose responsibility was it to see and make sure that car was there. I brought this up to the Trade Doughty Committee, and in my view, the jury's still out. They didn't know anything about it. So, while we're all focusing on the emails and all of that, there are still operational issues that need to be addressed. So, 6.30 in the morning, of 9-11, what's happening? The two policemen who were assigned to protect the compound are across the street taking photographs of the inside of the compound. This greatly disturbs Ambassador Stevens, to which he whipped off a quick message to the Minister of Defense complaining, as well he should. Sean Smith later tweets, and the, the essence of the message was, if we get out of tonight alive, we'll be lucky. It kind of gives you the sense, hey, did they know something was going to happen? Now let me tell you. I told you there was both strategic and tactical warning. You've heard about the strategic warning. Now I'm going to tell you about the tactical warning. We had seven to ten days advance notice of an attack going to be carried out on a U.S. facility in Benghazi. I first got this from uh, our GRS guys at the Annex, Tonto and T, and the other guys that wrote 13 hours. And not satisfied with that, I went to Mike Flynn, Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, who was the director of the IA, some, I guess, June 2012. He confirmed to me, yes, they had seven to ten days advance notice that an attack was going to occur. And you might ask, quite properly, well, what do we do about it? I have to tell you, as an operational commander, if I got that type of notice, I would be repositioning forces you know, as a commander, you never want to be caught unaware or off guard. And I got to tell you, in those situations, um, I'm prepared to preempt. And that's always been my motto. So 
you might say, well, what happened? Well, I'm sorry to report, nothing. The Met was devoid of all naval forces. We had one destroyer at Suda Bay and another destroyer at Rota. We had a 130-man Marine Force recon team at Sigonella. And as Michael had told me, we also had a 16-man Delta Force at Sigonella. You're an hour away from Benghazi. And you say, well, they didn't have their aircraft. Let me tell you, when you hear the guns going off, you go to it. You go with what you have. It's a war coming Well, that didn't happen. Now, we also had F-16 aircraft at Aviano. And of course, our illustrious chairman, uh, when queried why they weren't used, he said, oh, well, it would have taken 15 hours to get there. I mean, this is hogwash. I cleaned it up a little bit. <laughs> I defied the commander on the spot. I talked to Lieutenant General Tom McEnany, who was the vice commander of East Safety. In his view, he would have had a, a detachment of F-16s there in two to two and a half hours. You already have the 20 mic mic loaded in the belly of the aircraft for stability. You needed nothing else. All you had to do was make a low pass over that compound and those rag heads would have scattered. <laughs> Well, of course, that didn't happen. We finally did get a drone, but I'll get to that in a minute. So throughout the day, there were unusual events taking place. One of the reports in the late afternoon, oh, let me back up a minute. I think it was Teague who came over from the annex and briefed Ambassador Stevens, hey, we got a serious situation. Don't you want to hold your meeting over at the annex where we can better protect you? Stevens thanked him very much and said, no thanks. Yeah. You know, self-preservation kicks in somewhere. It didn't happen. So, late in the afternoon, the manager of the Blue Mountain Security Force, which was really an MI6 force, under contract, no big contract, and I'll let Stephanie talk about that. Um, things were not going right. The Blue Mountain manager put out an alert on his radio and and cell phone. Still nothing happened. It's reported that patrons in the restaurants were, were watching roadblocks set up. The Turkish Consul General arrives at the special mission compound for his dinner with Ambassador Stevens at 18.30, he had to pass through the roadblocks. Not a word mentioned. He departs there about an hour later. Around 20 hundred, the UK security team deposits their equipment in the, in the special mission compound. Again, no mention of roadblocks. Now, I'm sure during the dinner, 
Stevens and the Turkish Consul General talked about the flow of arms from Libya to the rebels in Syria. After all, Benghazi was the main focal point, and this is one of the tasks that I believe was assigned to Ambassador Stevens, along with trying to collect as many loose man pads as possible. So at about 21.42, the attack starts. Tonto and the rest of his team grab their equipment, their weapons, their vests, everything, jump in their car, and are ready to go to the compound. They're receiving the urgent call from the people in the compound. We're under attack. And you know, the pucker string gets a little tight when you got stuff whizzing by it. However, their chief of the base, no, however you want to slice it, it was a stand-up. He said, we're going to let the 17th February Martyrs Brigade handle it. And of course, they had a similar incident earlier, about a week before. And again, that chief of the base said, we're going to let 17th February. They never showed up. So what in hell did he think they were going to show up now? It never happened. Tonto and the guys pleaded with him three times, and he would not let them go. Finally, as true warriors, they gave him the salute and went. <laughs> They were able to rescue 27 people in that compound. Had they not showed up, they would have been more slaughtered. You know, the gods that we had were unarmed. The 17th February Martyrs Brigade. And yeah, you know, I gotta tell you, when I heard the 17th February Martyrs Brigade were the security force to that compound, I said, this is like giving Willie Sutton the keys to the bank vault. <laughs> you, you, you can't make this stuff up. And how they got this sole source contract, that's another story, and I'll let Stephanie cover that. Well, lo and behold, they did fight their way in. They found Ambassador Stevens' personal security guard hiding in the closet in that company with no weapons. Where were your weapons? Well, it's another little thing. They received a message, I'm told, from Secretary of State that said, you're to store your weapons in a separate room. Remove your vest and helmet. Now, I got to tell you, in that area of the world, you don't go to the head without your weapon. <laughs> Either one of them. <laughs> this was reported by the UK Guardian newspaper. I've never seen any denial. I gave this to the Gowdy Committee, too. They didn't have an answer at least not the people I talked to. So, I mean, I don't want to hog too much time here. We want to have questions and answers, but I've got to tell you, this never had to happen. This was a tragedy. And I can only sympathize with the families of the victims, we let them down. I never want to be part of an operation that lets our Americans down. We cannot let that happen. 